doing is a little bit different. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm focused on MCMC applications, uh, in particular geometric MCMC. So we'll see uh, how that really all comes down to Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, not really a lot of options, as, as we'll see. Uh, so I'm going to start by kind of motivating why we care about MCMC in particular, why we care about Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. That's going to get into a lot of the geometric foundations of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Uh, in particular, rebodying Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is double the geometry, or twice the fun. Uh, but it requires a metric, and um, we'll see it's a little trickier than what you get in information geometry. Uh, so we have to do something a little bit different, but we do get a very nice result and has some very nice computational properties, uh, particularly for practical use. Um, now, to avoid confusion, I'm talking about probability, I'm talking about geometry, but this is not a talk on information geometry, right? We're going to be using a lot of the same tools, but try not to confuse um, the applications that we've seen so far. In particular, one of the things that we'll see is that if you try to take the tools of information geometry and put them in a place where they're really not well defined, bad things happen. So this is kind of an orthogonal uh, line of, of application to you know what Paul uh, and Frank, um, and, and a lot of people I'm talking about so far in the conference. Uh, okay, so, uh, now the main thing is that information geometry is very frequentist in philosophy. Whereas I'm a pretty hardcore Bayesian, and I want to solve these kinds of problems. So, uh, in a Bayesian inference, you start with a prior, you model your likelihood, and you generate your data, and then you multiply it together in your posterior. What's nice about this approach, amongst many other things, is that all of the information about your system is encoded in the posterior. And that means that any kind of statistical query you might have comes down to a manipulation of the posterior. There's no tests, there's no additional assumptions. Everything's just a mathematical manipulation of the posterior. Um, so for example, if you think about summary statistics, that's just taking expectations. Marginalization is just integrating variables out. Even conditionals are Manipulating joints with marginals. So just about everything you can think of is integrating the posterior. Now that's very nice conceptually, because you know exactly what to do, but integration is really hard. Right? The complexity of your naive grid-based numerical integration scales exponentially with dimension. So outside of some really simple models, these kind of manipulations become really, really hard. Uh, and this is why one of the reasons why for a long time Bayesian methods really weren't doing anything. It was really not until the advent of really the ENIAC at uh, the Manhattan Project, but the personal computer. You know, that uptick is really right when everyone's getting a PC and starts doing these things at home. Uh, and the main uh, algorithm is, is MCMC. So we have these really hard integrations. To get rid of the, copy, the exponential scaling with dimension, we go to Monte Carlo integration, which is this very nice constant scaling with dimension. Uh, but Monte Carlo integration requires samples. And generating exact samples from an arbitrary distribution is just as hard as integrating, right? It has the same kind of exponential scaling. So that's bad. But we can generate dependent samples and get basically a good enough answer. We just have to take the correlation into account. So this is where the Markov chain comes in. So we're gonna run a Markov chain we're going to get correlated samples, and then we can use them for all of our Monte Carlo manipulations. That's the general procedure, and it's worked out really well uh, for, for a few decades. We're starting to, to see some issues. Um, now, let me just give kind of a mathy definition of a Markov chain, because it's a little bit different than what you might have typically seen from a probabilistic perspective. So the first thing we're going to define is a sample space. So we have our sample space omega, you have a braille algebra over omega if you really want to get technical. And then you have a posterior that you want to, or sorry, a measure, probability measure that you want to uh, conserve. So that is going to be our posterior, and omega is going to be our space of possible parameters for our model. Now, this is where things get a little weird. We're going to define a Markov chain as a distribution over maps of the state space into itself. Okay, so it, this is called an isomorphism. So it just takes your sample space, mixes it up, and returns it back again. And we want to think of randomly selecting a map, applying that to your state space, and that generates a new state space. And if you choose it correctly, 
you can preserve your measure. So the measure of all of your points is the same before and after. Uh, now what you typically see in probabilistic and statistical textbooks is a straight up definition of this. But as we'll see, this is a little bit nicer geometrically, and it also gives you uh, an idea of how it's actually done in practice. Uh, okay, so uh, we saw you know, there was a big uptick in the 90s, and for a long time, MCMC has been dominated by two algorithms, Random Walk Metropolis and the Gibbs Sampler. And there's a reason for that, because both of these algorithms are very easy to construct so that they, you can kind of engineer them to preserve an arbitrary measure. So if you give me your problem, you specify your density, these algorithms are guaranteed to work and converge to the samples you want. Um, now, random walk metropolis, we can define it as a probability, or as a transition density, again, as what you've typically seen in a probabilistic treatment. So we sample, we start take our concurrent point, we add random noise, and then we accept that proposal with some probability based on the density. Now, we can also think about this as isomorphism, as maps. So what you do here is you start with your space, you randomly choose a direction, you randomly choose a distance, you move your space along that direction, unless the probability is not good, right? So there, this is kind of the operational definition of, of the Markov transition, and this is what you code in on a computer, right? It's one of the reasons why it's nice to think about it this way. It's le much less abstract. Um, the other biggie is the Gibbs sampler, and here you sample from conditional. So Two-dimensional distribution, parameterized by parameters theta one and theta two, you sample theta one given theta two, theta two given theta one. Operationally, you randomly pick a direction and then you replace that point with a sample from a conditional. Now I'm going to ignore the fact that conditionals are really hard to compute and they require the same kind of manipulations we want MCMT for in the first place. But even ignoring that, we can see there's some problems. And the problems typically manifest when you're looking at things like this. So in high dimensions, things like non-convexities, things like spatially varying curvature, they're really common. Even for like Gaussians, right? When you think of the typical set of a Gaussian, it's really non-convex. Uh, so what you think of as pathologies in low dimensions are not at all rare in high dimensional models, even well-behaved high dimensional models. And it's exactly these properties that are going to stymie things like random one metropolis and the Gibbs. Um, so to, to emulate those kind of behaviors with this annular density, notice that it's very, very, very non-convex, right? The topology is very different. Um, and it's also has these very large variations of curvature. So you get radial curvature, uh, there's no azimuthal curvature, so you can your kind of orientation of curvature rotates along as you go around. So let's run a random walk metropolis chain and see what happens. So one thing to note is that the, the actual motion we can move is very, very tiny. That's because of the high variation of curvature. And then the non-convexities have this habit of getting it stuck. Right? It gets trapped in regions. Even though it looks like a perfectly fine well, it doesn't go anywhere. So you explore really slowly in a local neighborhood, and it's really hard to get at that local neighborhood. Even though it's not like there's a well here and a well here, right? It, should, it seems like there should be no problem. Uh, so, both of those things add up, you get very slow exploration, random walk-like exploration, and very high autocorrelations in your chain and bad MCMC. And unfortunately, the same thing happens with Gibbs. Again, the same idea. You get very slow, very uh, small movements, and then you get this habit of getting stuck. And it takes a long time to transition it out to get somewhere else. Uh, and at some level, this is not, shouldn't be surprising. Because if we go back to those mappings, let's see what happens. When we have high curvature, sigma has to be really, really small, or else a is going to always be zero. Right? And if you look at the Gibbs case, it's exactly these high curvature cases that the conditional variances are much, much smaller than the marginal variances. So what happens is you move a little bit, and then you randomize. And so all of that motion that you did gets basically washed away in the randomization. We're getting incoherent exploration, not coherent exploration. And that's what we want to do. We want to try to design an MCMC algorithm that has coherent exploration that's not susceptible to this random walk behavior. And the way we do that is appealing to differential geometry. So now here's where we're going to get a little bit more of an overlap. So 
So let's go back to our definition. Remember we have our sample space, our original problem, we have our Markov chain. Now let's imagine that it's a smooth density. We've got a nice, continuous, say infinitely differentiable density. That means we can think of our state space as a manifold. Right? And now our problem is trying to find coherent mappings of a manifold into itself. Any, anyone know of a coherent manifold mapping into itself? Right. Sir? The identity. That, that's one. Yeah. <laughs> Flows, right? And one of the beautiful things about differential geometry is you can define vector fields. And vector fields, at least locally, define these things called flows, which move the whole manifold along. You kind of drag it along. Now, the problem with these flows is that they don't necessarily preserve a measure. They tend to be you know, kind of divergent. And so we can't preserve our, 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 you know, our invariant measure pi unless you have, as Sam so eloquently recommended, a symplectic manifold. So a symplectic manifold has this nice special structure that allows you to turn a function into a Hamiltonian flow. And Hamiltonian flow has two very important properties. It preserves the density and it preserves volumes. Right? It turns, so it's very easy to engineer a Hamiltonian flow that preserves whatever measure you want. And that's what we're going to appeal to. Um, so just to know the naturalness, we want coherent motion. Really, the only place you're going to get large classes of coherent motion is in differential geometric manifolds. And of those, the only ones that are really easy to engineer are suspected manifolds. Right? So this isn't ad hoc in any sense. This is really kind of the only option we have. And so this is what our transition is going to look like. This is our Hamiltonian Monte Carlo transition. We're going to start on our base manifold, our sample space. We're going to lift up to the cotangent bundle. It's the only thing that has a natural symplectic structure around. The Hamiltonian flow is going to give us these nice coherent motion uh, transitions on the cotangent bundle. And then at the end, we just marginalize back down by integrating over the fibers to get back to our, our sample space. Now, the only thing that's not specified about this algorithm is that first step. How do we do that lift? How do we take a measure on the sample space and define that as a measure on the cotangent bundle? Right, that's not a natural operation. It goes against the projection. So uh, probabilistically, what we're doing is defining a conditional density. So if Q are coordinates of the sample space, P are coordinates of the uh, fibers of the symplectic part of the space, then we need to find a conditional P given Q. Right? Geometrically, what we're doing is defining kind of density-like objects on the fibers themselves. And that's going to give us a joint density on the symplectic space. And then we can choose our Hamiltonian to be equal to the minus log of that. And that's going to ensure that this, this symplectic flow, or this Hamiltonian flow that we get, preserves time. OK, everyone, everyone close so far? I'll take that as a yes. OK, so just a word on notation now. Uh, I'm a physicist, and as a physicist, I'm going to call everything physical things. So this kind of Hamiltonian actually shows up in classical mechanics quite a bit. That's where symplectic geometry comes from originally. And this term that depends on both P and Q is, is basically a kinetic energy. So just for notational sake, we're going to call that a kinetic energy. This is what we have to engineer. And then the second term that depends only on position, again, this is what's specified by our initial problem. This is a potential energy. So we know our potential energy. Now we have to engineer a kinetic energy to try to design an efficient algorithm. Now the simplest choice is taking this conditional density to be a Gaussian that's constant along all of the fibers. And that manifests as a quadratic kinetic energy. This kinetic energy is the same kinetic energy you see in classical mechanics. It's Euclidean motion. And so we're going to call this choice Euclidean Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Uh, and if any of you have read about HMC before, just about everything you've read has been Euclidean HMC. So I'm just going to just be pedantic. We're going to call this EHMC for the rest of the talk. Now, we implement this and run it on our annulus, and we see some very, very nice behavior. No more random motion. We're getting extremely coherent exploration of the posterior, right? 
And so what we do is at some point we stop our chain, we're really far away, we get a transition that's not local, it's all the way on the other side. It's very, very nice global exploration. Uh, and in fact, in practice, it's huge. Orders of magnitude improvement and effective sample sizes per time. And really the biggest thing, it allows you to start building models that you never could have before because it would take weeks to run MCMC on. Right? Um, but as with any tool, as soon as you put it out there, people are going to find the inefficiencies. And as good as the Euclidean HMC has been, there are two very distinct, I'll call them weaknesses. Uh, the first we can see right here. Notice that we spend a lot of time simulating high-frequency transverse motion. What we really want to do is just be going along the center. We're spending a lot of time going back and forth. Same thing that you see when you're trying to you know, run gradient descent on a long, narrow uh, objective function, right? Uh, now, this doesn't affect the validity of the algorithm. We still get coherent exploration. The problem is that computationally we're wasting a lot of time. It's not the most efficient trajectory that we could use. So, a little bit of an inefficiency. The other issue is a little bit more subtle, but it's a lot more uh, problematic. Remember along a Hamiltonian flow, the Hamiltonian is constant, right? And that means that the variation of the kinetic energy, the potential energy, has to be compensated for by variations in the potential, or the kinetic energy. But you can show either geometrically or probabilistically that the kinetic energy can only vary in equilibrium by half the dimensionality of your original system. So as an example, say we have a 100-dimensional posterior we're trying to sample from, that means the potential energy can only vary by 50. Now remember, the potential energy was the log density, so that means our, potential, our posterior density can vary by 20 orders of magnitude. Now that sounds like a lot, but in big problems, it's extremely easy to saturate that. And the biggest culprit are hierarchical models. Uh, so if you've done any modeling, no doubt you've seen a hierarchical model. They're extremely powerful. Uh, really, this, what this conditional dependence structure allows you to do is share information amongst the X's even if they're not exchangeable. It's extraordinarily powerful in practice. Um, but it's exactly the structure that gives you large variations in density. Because even if V varies by a little bit, that variation gets amplified by every one of the, of the descendant nodes. And if there's more layers, you start getting exponential amplification. Uh, now to see that graphically, this is a funnel. This is an emulative hierarchical model that has a lot of the properties that you see in practical hierarchical models. So these are latent variable, and it's going to control the variance of all of our descendant nodes x. So here's one of them. There's 100 of them, so 99 are going in and out of the board. And what you see is that when V gets small, the variance of the X's gets really, really tiny. But the density goes up. So we get low volume, high density. When V is really, really big, we get high volume, but low density. Now those two trends counter each other. And so if we look for a region of constant posterior mass, which is what we care about for MCMC, what we get is something like this. This is the neighborhood we want to explore to get an independent sample, right? But the density variation from top to bottom is 250 because of this hierarchical structure. And remember, we only have a 100-dimensional model, so that means we can only vary V by 50 during each transition. And indeed, if I run a transition, it only fills up a fifth of this neighborhood, right? That means I have to do the transition over and over and over again Hopefully the momentum resampling will move me around and eventually I'll explore everything. But I'll only do so incoherently because we're back to the same thing. We move only a very small distance and then every time we have to redo the transition we get more randomness that can with very high probability cancel all of the motion we just made. So that's bad. Now to get around both of these, we're going to appeal to a more sophisticated choice of the kinetic energy. We're now going to let our Gaussian covariance vary along the fibers, right? It's the next obvious generalization. This manifests as a slightly more sophisticated Hamiltonian. We now get a position dependent of the covariance, or what we're going to call metric here. And we get this normalization term, which is now not trivial. Uh, now, again, notation's sake, 
this is dynamics on a Riemannian manifold. Notice the double geometry that's coming in. So before we had symplectic geometry, then we had Euclidean geometry. Now we're adding Riemannian geometry. Um, and if we choose this metric correctly, we get two very important features. The first is that we get a position-dependent standardization. That basically makes everything look uh, isotropic locally. That should get rid of those high-frequency transverse oscillations. And then we get this guy, right? This guy comes up just because we want this to be a normalized log density. It has to be there. But check out what happens. If the, if the metric is somehow encoding curvature, then the law determinant acts as a kind of cap, uh, curvature capacity. When the curvature is really, really big, it sucks up a ton of energy. And when the curvature is small, it releases that energy back into the system. And that can help compensate for variations in the potential. Again, assuming we choose the metric correctly. Now, if we want some sense of curvature, we want local isotropy, the obvious choice is to take the Hessian. The problem is that in any kind of non-trivial model, the Hessian is not going to be positive definite. So that means that you're moving along in a nice smooth trajectory and all of a sudden you run off to infinity. Bad stuff happens. All right? it's, it's not a Riemannian metric. So if we want to use this information, we need to somehow regularize the Hessian. We need to map this to some kind of well-behaved object. Now this being an information geometry conference, I'm sure everyone has an idea of one option, and that's fisher rat Now, I've had to rejigger the uh, uh, conditionals a little bit here, because remember, we're, we're, we're thinking Bayesian, not, not frequentist. And so what you can do with fisher rat from this perspective is think about it as adding conditioning variables and integrating over them. So mathematically, it guarantees that the result is going to be positive semi-definite. Not quite as strong as information geometry, but it's often, right? It gets as close. Uh, now, one issue with this is that it requires conditioning variables. If we're thinking about a general Markov chain algorithm, we don't have conditioning variables. But let's ignore that, let's take the compromise. Let's say we're always going to be doing Bayesian inference, and so we're okay with doing that. The next problem is the integrations. Remember, we're doing MCMC to avoid integration in the first place. Now we have to do n squared, or you know, n squared over two integrations. That's bad. So what it forces you to do is simplify your model dramatically. So now you're getting a compromise of the models you want to use, which is the whole reason we're doing Bayesian inference in the first place. But let's okay, let's ignore that. Let's say we're going to simplify our problem. We're going to take that hit to get this better model. Still no. And here's why. If you look at the Hessian structure of a hierarchical model, the, like the one we care about, you get something like this. Now the x's are in this top left block. They're all conditionally independent, so we get a diagonal structure. The lane variables down here in the bottom right. And the important bit is the sidebands. The sidebands encode that conditional correlation. Yeah? Five oh, five minutes, yes, sorry. Um, uh, that encode the conditional correlation, but if you think about what the hierarchical model looks like, it's not that hard to see that when you take the expectations, the sidebands vanish. Right? Essentially, these guys are connected to the data nodes, and so you need the expectation it doesn't matter what other dependencies you might have. And so even if you accept the fact that you have three hard integrations, you accept the fact that you need conditioning, you still get, you lose all the structure you want. Right? This goes back to you take this object that's very nice and well-defined and well-behaved in information geometry, put it in a place it doesn't really belong, you're not going to get great results. Um, so we need something better. We need to try to avoid all of these problems. And the way we're going to do that is by just brute force regularizing the Hessian. Uh, now, there's not much intuition here. It seductively looks like you're doing some kind of parallel transport. Uh, I don't fully understand why. But if you look at the eigen spectrum, it starts looking really clear what's happening. If you start with an arbitrary matrix, an arbitrary eigenvalue, and you plug it through this transformation, you know two things. One, if the eigenvalue is positive, it stays positive. If it's negative, it goes to positive. And if it's small, it gets threshold. So what we're essentially doing is if you think of the symmetric, the space of symmetric matrices as a bunch of cones, you're rotating your cone to the connected component to the identity, 
and then shrinking it a little bit. So it's got a very nice geometric interpretation. Uh, so, but what it does in practice is it doesn't matter what patient structure is, what we're going to get is a positive definite matrix that depends smoothly on position, which is exactly what we need for a Riemannian metric. And so if we plug it into our annulus, what you see are now the high frequency oscillations are gone. We're getting these shooting trajectories that are very, very efficient. Notice it goes fast in regions of low curvature and slow in regions of high curvature, so it's naturally adaptive. And most importantly, if we go to the funnel, we get these nice sweeping trajectories, right? This is all that law of term. We can explore the entirety of the probability mass. We can essentially get independent samples if we run long enough. And we get back to that coherent exploration that gives us this very, very efficient MCMC. So I hope we give you some motivation for why, you know, if you are doing a patient problem, you want to do MCMC, this is really it, right? This is the kind of the natural way to encode coherent exploration. And computationally, it's quite, quite nice. All you have to do is calculate derivatives. In fact, the derivatives can be done very efficiently using automatic differentiation techniques. And if you're a fan of computing packages, this should be in SAN, the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo package, in two months. Don't quote me on it, but something like that. Um, so when it's out, I hope you give it a try. And I hope you'll see that you can start building models uh, much, much bigger than you, than you had before. Thanks.